welcome to the Bon Secours Richmond Community Education Awareness Series on Neuroscience. I'm Pat Lane, a Neuroscience Coordinator for Bon Secours Richmond. We are pleased to provide this community awareness show on neuroscience, and we hope that we offer a wide variety of topics over the next few weeks to really spark your neuroscience interest. At Bon Secours, we provide good help to those in need. If there are any questions you would like answered or more information, please make sure you call our Bon Secours number, which is 804-359-WELL, or check out our website at www.bonsecours.com. You can also contact me, Patricia underscore Lane, at bshe.com, and that information will be up on your TV screen throughout the show. So this evening, I am pleased to host Dr. Scott Schimpf and Amber Devers. Our topic this evening is good moves, how to care for your spine, what's our treatment approach. Community, start with me by improving your spine health by sitting up straight and let's listen to our esteemed panel. I'm happy to introduce our first panelist, Amber Devers. Amber is a physical therapist at Sheltering Arms in Mechanicsville, where they help patients find the power to overcome. Amber is viewed as an emerging leader in the field of physical therapy. She received her undergraduate degree from VCU and her doctor of physical therapy from Old Dominion University. She is cer certified in neural developmental treatment and has presented on the iWalk, Advanced Technology for Walking, and is the state legislative chair for the Virginia Physical Therapy Association. Welcome, Amber. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Scott Schimpf. Dr. Schimpf specializes in interventional spine care. His training includes a physical medicine and rehabilitation residency, focusing in on interventional pain management at the University of Minnesota and a pain medicine fellowship in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Both very cold places, Dr. Schimpf. We'll have to talk about that. Very cold. <laughs> he is a member of the Physiatry Association of Spine, Sports, and Occupational Rehabilitation in the American College of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Schimpf sees patients at Sheltering Arms, Spine, and Sports Center on the St. Mary's Hospital campus. Dr. Schimpf, thank you for being here this evening. My pleasure, thank you. Now this is our third week audience on Comcast discussing neuroscience and so far we really focused on the brain with topics such as migraines, headaches, post-concussive post syndrome, and brain tumors. But today it's all about our spine, the other vital part of neuroscience and the central nervous system. So we're gonna get a very quick anatomy lesson and I want you all to know, you can actually go to YouTube. I was gonna to try to show this clip today. There's a nice 67, <clears throat> 60 second clip on the basic anatomy of the spine, but I'm gonna ask Dr. Schimpf and Amber just to start off. My mother used to always talk about one way that you could be good with to your spine was sitting up straight and so i'm sitting up really straight today um is that really good for your back the, what my mother drilled in my head is that really true dr shem do you think it, it is true uh, good posture is um, is is helpful for the spine particularly for the muscles in the lower back okay all right. And Amber, as a physical therapist, can you share with us some other pearls of wisdom of what to do to have a healthy spine or some exercises that you think would be good and so that we can keep um, our, our, our backs in good shape? Sure. I'll talk about some just general lifestyle mm -hmm. um, habits that uh, will help with spine health. And I think it's interesting about the comment about a straight spine. The spine actually has some natural curves in it. And um, if you do look up that video, I think you'll be able to see that. So our spine isn't completely straight and it's um, important that we can maintain those normal curves throughout life. 
Um, a way to do that is to really watch the mechanics of movement. Um, that's something that I really specialize in and making sure that the way you lift objects is proper, um, not twisting um, while you're holding a heavy load. Um, there's lots of different things you can do um, to make sure that while you're lifting or moving things that you can do that safely. Another thing is to maintain your um, core strength and your abdominals really help support the spine. And so um, core exercises and um, working on balance are actually very good for spine health. You can also make sure you just manage your weight. That's very helpful not to increase the load on the spine. Good sleep is important. Our spine actually absorbs water in, in the discs overnight. And so allowing the appropriate amount of sleep allows that uh, normal fluid to um, return to the discs overnight and um, also smoking cessation can be really important for spine health and many people with back trouble will recover better if um, they can quit smoking. Okay, those are great tips on that. Now Dr. Schimpf, we, we were talking about how to take care of your spine so we wanted to know, um, I've heard some terminology and I know that the community will want to know, well if I did those things um, can I keep my, my, my spine 100% well all the time? And um, so if you can talk about maybe how your spine may start to change as the season does, mm -hmm. um, and when it starts to change, and is that normal process or the normal process of the spine? Sure, sure, we can talk about that. So <clears throat> the, the spine un unfortunately undergoes what we refer to as degenerative changes over time. Uh, and those degenerative changes can uh, be present in all aspects of the spine. The spine itself is a very complex structure that is made from bones and ligaments and tendons and nerves uh, that are supported by muscles. And <clears throat> over time, several different parts of the spine can degenerate. And what I mean by that is that <clears throat> the discs, for example, which are basically like shock absorbers in between the bones that stack together to make up our spine, those discs over time will lose water content mm. um, even if we get enough sleep. Uh, and, uh, and when the discs lose water content, there's a tendency to develop little cracks and fissures and tears in the discs themselves. And over time, that leads to a general de general decrease in function of the discs. The, as I mentioned, the primary function of the disc is as a shock absorber. So over time, the disc will have a tendency to get squished or flattened, and it will be less of a <clears throat> powerful shock absorber uh, when that happens. And that also can potentially cause pain. Uh, there are portions of our discs that have nerve fibers that are specific for pain information. And when the discs over time become degenerative, those pain nerve fibers will fire more frequently and will feel back pain associated with the discs. Okay. Other structures in the spine that are uh, prone to the degenerative process are the joints of the spine. There are multiple joints in our spine. And just like our knees and our hips, the joints in our spine over time will develop arthritis. Um, and it, it could be um, a systemic type of arthritis, but in most cases it is a general wear and tear type of osteoarthritis that we develop in the spine. Okay, so we're going to talk about pain a little bit down the road, but I want to talk a little bit to Amber about how you actually got into physical therapy and to talk about the track of physical therapy because you actually have your doctorate. We think that's very interesting because one of the things we want our community to know, and you're kind of a local, went to VCU, so that program is here right in <laughs> Richmond, and even though VCU and ODU are like oil and that shock absorber is needed. Um, <laughs> if you can talk a little bit about that and how you got interested in, in being a physical therapist. 
Sure. I actually, um, you know, didn't really know what I was going to do until high school and late in high school, probably junior year. And um, Christopher Reeve actually had his accident mm -hmm. at that time. He fell off of a horse and sustained an injury to his spinal cord. So it's interesting we're talking about spine today. Um, that's really what got me into physical therapy. And um, I saw, you know, a nighttime broadcast and they were showing a little bit of his rehab process. And um, I kind of went through wanting to maybe be a teacher, um, but I also had a background in dance. And um, when I saw what the physical therapist was doing, I felt like it was a really a good uh, match of you know, kind of both those interests for me. So as a physical therapist, I'm really kind of um, an expert in, in function and mobility for people. And being able to know about how the body works through my dance experience, but then also wanting to teach people has been really, really helpful in my career. Um, the way I got started was I did go to VCU. Um, I got uh, actually an undergraduate degree in psychology. So there are many different undergraduate degrees you could get um, prior to getting a physical therapy degree, things like biology, uh, exercise science. There are lots of different options, which is really great. It allows for a lot of different study before you actually go to physical therapy school. And most schools in Virginia now for your physical therapy degree are a doctorate program. So that means three more years of school. And I went to ODE because I'm actually from Virginia Beach. Oh, okay. um, so that's why I went back down that way. Um, and so three years, and that consists of um, both you know, classroom work and labs, um, but also in the summers, usually sometimes during the semester, you actually work with patients and you do internships. Um, so it's uh, pretty rigorous. Um, and the, you know, the goal of um, the Physical Therapy Associ Association, why we kind of moved towards a doctorate, was just to be more responsible for people's health and wellness um, and to you know, really be able to see them kind of ongoing and, and feel like we really had the expertise to see people throughout their life and take care of their mobility and function. Great. Now, Dr. Schimpf, you have a very interesting background. Can you talk about how you combined your education and how you got interested in those two? That's a sure. good combination. Well, my residency training is in a specialty called physical medicine and rehabilitation. And <clears throat> in short, that is a specialty of medicine that specializes in helping patients restore function after a chronic medical condition, such as, for example, a spinal cord injury or a stroke or a traumatic brain injury or um, chronic joint arthritis, any condition that causes a chronic debilitating condition. And I had the opportunity to um, rotate through a spine clinic, an interventional clinic during residency, uh, and, uh, and very much enjoyed working with the spine itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I made the decision uh, towards the end of residency to um, obtain specific training in interventional medicine, spine medicine, pain medicine. Uh, and so I decided to uh, pack up and move from Minneapolis to Pittsburgh, uh, where I did a, a, a wonderful pain medicine fellowship program, uh, and then, um, which was fantastic. I think it was excellent training, excellent experience. And then uh, once I finished there, I moved here and joined Sheltering Arms. Okay, great. So let's talk a little bit about pain and spine pain in particular. In the spine, I wish I'd be looking like there's a spine in front of me. Is there um, <clears throat> pain found, uh, is there a worse place for pain in the spine? Or uh, depending on the injury, if you wanna talk about that, how um, can you define that pain and, and how do you work with your patients for pain with that? So I, I think the worst place in the spine to have pain is wherever you happen to have pain in the spine. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I, I would definitely say the most common place to have spine pain is in the lower back. Lower back pain accounts for the majority of uh, what we as pain medicine specialists or spine interventionalists deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, however, we can see pain anywhere from the base of the skull down to the tailbone, anywhere in the spine. Uh, and, um, and some of those pain conditions are due to trauma. Oftentimes, more frequently, they're due to degenerative conditions. Okay. Now, how would someone get to you? Um, how are they referred? Mm -hmm. How would they learn about you? If you can talk about your clinic sure. a little bit, because that sure. was new to me. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> in most cases, 
Um, depending on the insurance, uh, oftentimes uh, folks will need a referral from their primary care physician to see a pain medicine specialist. Okay. Um, some insurances do not require a referral from primary care, but oftentimes that is the case. Uh, and so the majority of uh, new patients uh, that I evaluate are patients who have had pain for a sometimes a relatively short amount of time in the spine and sometimes for decades in the spine. And uh, they're working with their primary care physician uh, who ultimately determines that it is appropriate for that particular individual to see a specialist in the spine. Um, and so, like I said, sometimes we, we see folks who um, are relatively young and relatively healthy and have normal anatomy in, the, in their spine, um, but um, uh, went rock climbing over the weekend mm -hmm. and, and had an acute uh, musculoskeletal injury or maybe had a disc problem, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and also we see patients who have had um, you know, the full gamut of treatment for their spine over a span of 20 to 30 years. Uh, and they've undergone multiple rounds of uh, treatment, including physical therapy, um, medication management, sometimes have had multiple back surgeries already. So we see the full gamut. So what type of exam would you do for this patient and diagnostics? Are there certain mm -hmm. tests or anything that you would do for these Indeed. patients? Indeed. So, so we start with every new patient with a very thorough history and a physical exam. Uh, and the physical exam uh, looks closely at the different structures of the spine itself. And it also looks at the integrity of the nerves that leave our spine and travel down into different parts of our body. For example, the nerves that leave the spine in the neck travel into our arms and into our hands. The nerves that leave our spine and our lower back leave the spine and travel down into our hips and into our legs. Okay. Um, so we're looking to make sure that the nerves themselves are healthy uh, and um, it, you know we can, we can often tell quite a bit from just the history of how the pain began. Uh, was it a slow degenerative type of process or was it an acute injury? Uh, and then uh, beyond the history and physical examination, we have a number of tools that we can use to help diagnose the problem. Um, the most common of which is radiology, which would include things like x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans. Um, <clears throat> there are specific tests for, again, the uh, testing the integrity of the nerves in the arms or the nerves in the legs. That test is called a, a EMG, which stands okay. for electromyography. Okay. And uh, there are also some interventional tools that we utilize uh, for diagnostic purposes. And by that, I'm uh, referring to type of injections in the spine. Okay, hold on to that because we may get into that. Amber, when do you come into play? Do you ever work, um, do you ever proceed seeing Dr. Schimpf? How, how does that work with the um, physical therapy? Right, I think it could definitely go both ways. And okay. I, I think Dr. Schimpf probably sees this where patients are coming um, after physical therapy and maybe are not getting the results that they hoped, are still having pain. Um, potentially the pain is getting worse. Um, not from the physical therapy, but just from the condition itself. Um, or perhaps um, afterwards, after an injection, when the patient's pain is lessened and now they're able to really get back into the retraining of functional movements, um, you know, making sure that their balance is uh, sufficient to prevent falls, things like that. So I think we would definitely see them both ways. I think one of the big things um, when you've been in pain for so long, you tend to avoid a lot of activities. Mm -hmm. And um, they may be activities that aren't necessarily cause of pain, but because you're in pain, you're doing a lot of uh, avoidance. You're probably tensing your muscles. And then if someone can get relief from that pain through an injection, they may be able to come to me and kind of relearn a lot of those um, activities. And we can, you know, just start gradual and then work up and continually kind of assess you know, what's the next step. Um, so I think that's where physical therapy can be really beneficial, especially after a procedure, is that even though you have a procedure, it doesn't mean you're 100% normal again. There's a lot of relearning and retraining to do afterward. Okay. So I think in your um, bio, also I read about neurodevelopmental training. Is that some of that what you're talking about, or is that totally different? 
That's different. That's actually typically a technique used for people after stroke that have sustained weakness on one side. Okay. Um, so it's a very specific, um, basically, a handling strategy in order to facilitate muscle use and appropriate patterns and things. I would say, you know, there might be times when I c can evaluate a patient who has um, had some spine uh, pain, perhaps, especially if there's some nerve um, damage associated with that and um, if they're able to get relief. Um, from pressure on the nerves and muscles are coming back, there's an ability to kind of use some specific um, techniques and ways to help them through movement that would kind of facilitate their muscles getting more action. But typically that technique's thought of for people after stroke. Okay. So we're going to take call callers. We will take phone calls between 6.30 and 6.45, and that number is 804-915-5202. So Dr. Shim, can you tell us a little bit about the clinic at St. Mary's? Um. Certainly. <clears throat> so the Sheltering Arm Spine Clinic uh, is a comprehensive pain medicine clinic. Uh, and we actually have two offices, uh, one in Bonaire uh, and also one at the St. Mary's Hospital campus. And <clears throat> we utilize um, not only interventional work, which we can talk about uh, in a bit, but we also rely heavily on the expertise of our physical therapy team. Uh, we also have the ability to provide aquatic therapy, which is physical therapy in a heated therapeutic pool, which is oftentimes very much appreciated. Um, and uh, we also have a pain psychology team. Yeah. And, uh, and that is utilized uh, quite a bit. Um, it is very helpful to allow patients the opportunity to sit down uh, with somebody um, who may be able to offer suggestions on how to manage pain on a day-to-day -day basis that doesn't involve taking a medication or having an injection or having a back surgery. So we find that to be very useful. Now you said I wanted to go and get my bathing suit on and you said aquatic therapy. Yes. That's very good for you. Why, why is aquatic therapy so good? Well, being in um, a pool environment really allows you to almost have some of your body weight kind of removed. Okay. And so we can start with exercises that you wouldn't normally be able to do on the ground against gravity. Um, so the buoyancy of the pool can really allow for more mobility and doing some exercises. And, and really the thought is to start there and definitely progress to overground. Um, we don't want you to be in the pool for life. Um, mm -hmm doing your exercise, although it's, it's great to do, um, you know, regular just swimming as an exercise. The other thing is with the heat, it can really relax muscles and it kind of increases blood flow too, which can be really good um, for painful areas to get a little bit more blood flow um, for potential healing and um, kind of moving around some uh, more toxic things that occur in, in the pain cycle. So if I am injured, if I injure my back, newly injured, should I use heat or should I use cold? Usually cold. Okay. So, I agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> Early on, the process is going to be what we would say is inflammatory. Um, so, there are lots of things happening, and in, in it should actually, when something's inflamed, it usually feels hot hot and bothered and might even, it would be red if it was something external. And so ice is always good for the first um, phase of healing, that inflammatory phase. And heat is a little bit better when you start to get things like kind of muscle tension and guarding um, that might occur later after that initial inflammatory phase. Okay. So let's talk about some of your uh, pain um, that you were talking about, some of the things that you do, if you could expand on sure. some of those treatments. Some of the other treatment options. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we will frequently perform what we refer to as interventional treatment options. And the interventional part of pain medicine or, or spine medicine uh, really refers to a group of injection type procedures mm -hmm. that we can utilize to target specific areas of the spine or the nerves leaving the spine to try to decrease pain and increase function. Okay. So there's a number of different options, probably the most common of which is a epidural steroid injection uh, or a joint injection. And the, the main goal behind that type of treatment is to, under the guidance of an x-ray camera, we can insert a needle 
into the precise location in the spine where we uh, know that there is a inflammatory process going on. And <clears throat> we can then inject or deliver a very powerful anti-inflammatory medicine, which is a steroid, mm -hmm. into that area, uh, which is oftentimes much more uh, beneficial, much more effective in treating spinal conditions than taking the same type of medication by mouth orally because when we take a medication by mouth the medication gets into our stomach and then into our bloodstream and it goes everywhere throughout our body um, but with spinal intervention it allows us to deliver the right medication to the precisely the right location uh, and and that usually is as I said more effective um, the types of spinal intervention that we perform in the spine clinic include not only epidural injections but also joint injections um, we will often target uh, specific small nerves in and around the spine uh, that have various functions, including providing pain sensation to the joints of the spine. Uh, we can actually apply heat to specific pain nerves and get rid of them. Uh, we can actually cauterize those nerves. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we'll perform procedures on the actual discs themselves and those procedures are sometimes designed to be diagnostic, meaning we're looking to make a diagnosis uh, and sometimes meant to be therapeutic, which means we're trying to affect a, a positive response, which means a decrease in pain and in improvement in function. Um, <clears throat> we also have the ability to uh, perform other procedures such as uh, spinal cord stimulation. Mm -hmm. a, uh, a spinal cord stimulator is a electrode that gets placed in the spine and essentially it creates an electrical current within the spinal cord and it is designed to take the area where a person is having pain and kind of replace that pain with almost like a tingling sensation which is oftentimes much better than the pain itself. Um, so that, that's another tool, not something that we would go to as our first step in most cases, uh, but we have a number of different interventional options. The interventional management uh, sometimes is extraordinarily effective and sometimes it is effective but it is temporary uh, and occasionally it's not effective and when it's not effective and we've exhausted those types of conservative treatment options then we look to alternative treatment options and that oftentimes includes a surgical referral. Okay. All right, and most of your treatments can be done right there in the clinic, or does the person have to be hospitalized at all? No, that's a great question. One of the major benefits of, of spinal intervention is that the vast majority of procedures are done on an outpatient basis, uh, which means that um, my patients um, rarely, if ever, need to spend a night in the hospital um, for the types of procedures that we perform. Uh, and we have, um, we have several locations where we perform these procedures. One of those locations is actually in our office. Yeah. Okay. So it's a very convenient way of, of getting management uh, at the Shelter and Arm Spine Clinic because we really kind of have everything that we need under one roof. We have therapy and aquatics and pain psychology and my office and our interventional spine suite, which would include all the equipment, all the surgical equipment that we would need and, and um, the x-ray cameras that we utilize for the procedures. Okay. And Amber, I'm sure that the treatment plans are individualized, we learn that, but after someone may have done that type of treatment, would they come and see you and how long would that treatment be? Um, or session with you, or is that what you all call a session? Or sure, um, you know, we'd probably call it um, an episode of care, say. So um, perhaps after one of the injections, you know, like I said, it, it definitely depends on how limited the person became, you know, during that period where they were, you know, you know, agonizing with pain um, and things like that. So, you know, we would do again a full history just. Um, like Dr. Schimpf does, where we really ask questions about, um, have you been having trouble walking? Have you been having trouble um, moving in bed, getting out of bed? Um, do you have trouble getting up and down stairs? Do you sometimes, you know, trip and fall? Um, we ask questions all about how people move. Um, is this affecting how you work? Are you limited with what you're able to do with work? So we definitely want a full history of kind of what the spectrum of functioning is. And like I said, oftentimes people 
people are avoiding certain activities during that pain cycle. So if we can relieve the pain, it's a time to kind of gradually start up and then again do a lot of education about the things I talked about at you know the beginning. Like how do we prevent, you know, perhaps you have a degenerative condition that this might be something you're gonna have to kind of live with, but also if it was more of an injury or a repetitive stress um, type syndrome, you know, how do we kind of prevent these nerves or joints from getting further irritated? Um, so a lot of that is um, body mechanics training, um, postural training. Um, many times people um, might stand just to one side if they have pain down one leg and so they're going to be putting all their weight on an opposite leg maybe even in that leg now starting to develop some hip and knee pain from having you know their weight on that leg all the time so we can really assess how that standing posture looks and perhaps retrain um, for standing more equally on both legs. Um, I think balance is probably actually a really important aspect that people don't think of mm -hmm. when you um, start to limit your activities because of pain your balance strategies actually really decrease and you'd be more prone to a fall if now you're feeling better and you get back to some activities and you've lost balance strategies. Um, so, you know, it's really our job to, we have several um, tests that we can do to determine if you're at risk for falling mm -hmm. and we would do those and then based on that we could do some treatments that would really help people get balance um, strategies back and make sure that they're not going to fall and have more injuries, you know, after their spine's feeling good. Good. Now I'm going to say again, callers, the number here is 804-915-5202. Emma, can you tell us a little bit about sheltering arms? I know that you're at the Mechanicsville area, but are there other centers around all around Richmond? I'm fairly new to here. So. Sure. So yeah. I um, see mostly inpatients. So these are people that are requiring um, a hospital stay mainly for rehabilitation, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy, um, but also have the need of having a physician there daily as well as um, nurses there 24 hours. So I work in that hospital in Mechanicsville. There's another location of our hospital um, on the St. Francis campus um, of the Bon Secours uh, system. And then we have about 10 or 11 outpatient clinics um, so that people all over the area, both north, south side, um, can receive outpatient um, treatments. And that's when you go for your physical therapy appointment for you know, a short period of time, 45 minutes, an hour, and then you would leave and go home. And we also have one, um, you know, a bigger uh, recreation facility as well, where for people that don't need actual therapists with them anymore, they can still go and participate in activities oh. with other people that have gone through similar um, experiences either injuries or illnesses um, and, and so they can go and do therapeutic recreation and um, really work on just living a healthy um, healthy life. And Dr. Shim, I know you is the St. Mary's the only one where the, this clinic is at this clinic? No, the, the spine clinic is at St. Mary's and also we have a second office in Bonaire. Oh, okay. Which is south of the river. Okay, so yes. you have one on both that, sides. One on so both sides, expand, that's right. Um, and I know it's football time and, you know, <laughs> the sports I hear, the fall sports. Um, do you see a lot of sports injuries or uh, in the clinic or do you have anything that um, you can tell these nervous mothers? I don't have a son, but I would think about, you know, oh God, don't hit my son and stay right. away. You can't play any sports. So. Right. Uh, in my particular clinic, we see some sports injuries, um, although not a lot. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and um, the, the sports injuries that we see typically are not uh, direct spine injuries. They're more um, joints, larger joints, uh, okay. shoulders, knees, hips, that sort of thing, uh, which we will certainly also address. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the sports injuries related to the spine um, are uh, most of the time due to an acute trauma, like for example in football uh, or other high impact sports uh, and in those uh, instances we're looking unfortunately at things like fractures of the bones of the spine. Not, not necessarily but we can also see uh, disc injuries. Uh, but in most cases um, acute injuries like fractures are managed um, surgically uh, or they are managed conservatively, but during an inpatient stay elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, callers, we did have one of our neurosurgeons who's going to be with us tonight, but he was called away 
for surgery, and that's what happens in the healthcare world that we live. So I know Dr. Shimp, you said sometimes that that happens, that patients have to go to a neurosurgeon. And do you all work together? Um, do they sometimes send patients back to you, or yes, is indeed. it a combination? Or Yes, indeed. That, that's a great question. We, we work uh, with a number of excellent spine surgeons in the greater Richmond metropolitan area. Uh, and um, there's, um, there's a very strong relationship between uh, pain medicine physicians or spine interventionalists and spine surgeons. Uh, and um, the spine surgeons have specific skill sets uh, that are oftentimes required mm -hmm. to solve a particular problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a general rule, I think both the spine surg surgical community and the pain medicine community uh, agree that if we can keep somebody out of the operating room and reduce pain and restore function, uh, that's oftentimes a great choice. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there are uh, times when uh, the uh, full gamut of conservative treatment has been trialed and we've been unsuccessful at solving a particular problem, uh, whether it be pain or a particular neurologic problem such as profound muscle weakness uh, or uh, other neurologic problems such as loss of bowel or bladder function mm -hmm. related to the spine. Um, those are, that, that is the time when uh, we would refer our patients to a spine surgeon for a consultation uh, and, and see if they have a good surgical solution to the problem. Now you mentioned, um, that was a good point about other maybe diagnosis and one that kind of came to mind. I don't know if there's pain with it, but um, multiple sclerosis. Do you see any other type besides just spine um, patients? We do. I, I, I treat a number of, uh, of patients who have multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. um, who also happen to have specific spine mm -hmm. problems. Um, there, there are <clears throat> a number of conditions, other neurologic conditions that are not directly related to the spine that can cause chronic pain issues. Um, and uh, that oftentimes is a function of a injury to parts of the central nervous system, the brain or spinal cord, uh, that transmit or interpret pain sensation. Okay. Now, Amber, I know that um, tonight is supposed to be about spying, but I know that you do have some other talents, and I wanted the uh, callers and community to know a little bit more about Shelter and Arms because I think you all have a lot of um, things that you can do and equipment that other places don't. And one of my favorites is the eye walk. And I wish we had a picture, but you can certainly tell them where they can go to find that picture and talk about that. Sure, our website, um, www.shelteringarms.com has um, you know some great information about all of our clinics, the spine clinic, eye walk, very, all of the clinics that you can find. Um, so yeah, I mean, my passion is really working with people after a neurologic injury or illness. Um, that can be something like multiple sclerosis, but also stroke and spinal cord injury. Um, and I definitely am interested in helping people walk again. That's one of the biggest um, impairments that I see um, when I'm working in the hospital. So Sheltering Arms, um, a couple years ago, decided to invest um, a lot of money in specific technologies that can be used to help people gain uh, walking recovery usually faster or perhaps um, something that wasn't offered before that they can get now and maybe restore some function that they had lost years ago. Um, so it's uh, really fun. Basically, the science of rehab right now is neuroplasticity, which means that our brains and spinal cords do have some capacity to kind of change um, and you know rewire after injury. Um, so the technology really allows us to implement those um, neuroplastic techniques in, in the best way. An example is that um, repetition is really important when you're learning how to walk. And if I need to hold you up um, for you to be able to walk and I need to you know, physically assist your leg in moving, we could probably go about 20 feet before we're both really worn out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but if I can put you in one of our robotic devices, you might actually be able to walk you know, 800 feet in 10 minutes. Um, so that repetition has been shown to be really key to helping the brain kind of restore some of that function. Every person's individual, we, you know, we try to um, use 
the factors of the person to really make a decision about prognosis and, and what recovery can be restored. But um, it's really exciting to have the tools to kind of use the science that's out there now. So both of you, the tools when we talk about in, in science, it made me think about, you know, rehab means function to make you function. I miss those days. But mm -hmm. in your work, do either one of you go out to work places or is that part of your history to talk about that um, in the work site, what you can do to have good back pain or if you're following a patient? Do you have some, do you ever go to their job or talk about that or work with their work site to see what's going on? Um, I definitely know that part of um, physical therapy is definitely ergonomic. So that's how your environment is set up to maintain good posture, good body mechanics and movements. Um, I haven't personally visited uh, many sites, but there are physical therapists that are especially trained to go and look at how your work environment is set up and seeing is this going to be efficient for you to be able to you know, do the work for the number of hours a day you need to do without sustaining an injury. Um, and so definitely physical therapists um, are, are experts in kind of evaluating those situations and, and making sure that we can prevent injuries. I mean, I definitely want to stay in the rehab business, but we do know that a lot of preventative care is, um, you know, some of the best care that we can offer. Okay. Now, Dr. Schimpf, you talked about earlier, too, I think a little bit about psychology mm -hmm. and pain. Can you talk a little bit about that in the clinic, how that's set up or to sure. make that match? And you also made a good point. Somebody's pain is, th is their pain. So, right. you know, so, and that's important as well. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, pain is a it's a very challenging condition to treat when pain becomes long-standing and chronic because pain typically leads to decrease in function and decrease in function typically translates into decrease in productivity mm -hmm. uh, decrease in productivity typically leads to being anxious about am I going to be able to go to work tomorrow am I going to be able to pay the bills um, anxiety oftentimes will lead to uh, feeling depressed uh, and <clears throat> over an extended period of time the anxiety and the changes in mood that are very commonplace in chronic pain conditions uh, are oftentimes almost become more significant more of a debilitating factor than the actual physical pain itself and so, <clears throat> especially when I'm working with folks who have had pain for an extended period of time, uh, it's important to take a look at their mental health as, long, as well as their uh, physical examination and the actual spine and their joints and their nerves and their muscles. Uh, and so to that end, um, I will often refer a patient um, to our pain psychology colleagues who fortunately uh, are right down the hall from me and we're able to uh, confer and, and share information uh, on an hourly basis if we need to. Um, and, uh, and they have the ability to uh, spend a lot of time uh, with the patients and really kind of get at the heart of what is creating their anxiety and what is making them feel depressed. Uh, as it relates to their mood and offer suggestions on how to counter that. Okay, great. Yeah, I think those are, you know, the pain psychologists even for us after someone's had a major surgery are so important. I think knowing myself from injuries that I've gone through, when you have pain, you start to become really vigilant to that and it's, you have an extreme amount of focus on your pain and, you know, it's hard to even think about anything else because you're so, you know, painful and the um, psychologists are really good at helping you start to, you know, recognize other things that are going on. And that's so helpful to me when we're working on mobility. Sometimes people's focus on that pain and how much it is, you know, is it more today than it was yesterday, even keeps them from noticing like the progress that they're making. Mm -hmm. I walked, you know, 200 more feet today. They might not even notice it because they're just paying attention to their pain. So having the psychologist there to really help work through that um, psychological process process and emotional process is very helpful. So sometimes do you coach re then or you just read their treatment plan and then maybe put some of those things into effect? Yeah, I know in the hospital we have weekly team meetings and okay. so all the um, practitioners involved in the person's care meet as a team and really talk about, um, you know, how um, we can work uh, effectively with 
all the things that we're each working on. So if the psychologist is working on one, one strategy with this patient, you know, I can try to use that during my treatment session if it's a certain way that they um, respond to uh, um, about thinking about their movement or it's kind of hard, everyone's a little different to come up with specific examples, but um, it's definitely, we do meet as a team weekly to really talk about the patient's progress and what we can each kind of be carrying over from each individual session that the person has. Okay. Um, it's 6.45, so I guess we didn't get any callers today. I'm going to just make a couple of announcements. We have, this is our third show. Next week, we will start our double hitter, which will be on stroke risk factors, and we will be talking about hypertension, diabetes, diet, what are some resources out in the community um, building up to our risk factors of stroke, um, certainly obesity. We'll talk about some dietary things that you can do, exercise we've heard today, um, as well as sleep. And we will have a physician on to talk about sleep apnea. Then the week after that, we will be talking about um, if you have a stroke, what you need to do. Um, and, and one will be definitely calling our emergency medical uh, system, making sure we call 911. We will have an emergency medicine, uh, medicine physician here, as well as a neurologist, and also talk about some of the interventional treatments that we can now be doing for stroke. And then the last week, we will be talking about um, epilepsy and seizures as we move towards that. So, um, Dr. Shim, we have about 15 minutes left, and so I was going to ask you all to talk about really anything that you, you wanted to, to stress to the community about maybe the clinic, like we haven't talked about the clinic hours or anything sure. like that, um, or whatever else you would, would like to talk about. Well, just some details uh, about the clinic itself. Uh, our, our hours are from eight until about four o'clock, um, sometimes five o'clock in the evening. Uh, a typical week for our clinic is uh, we have office visits uh, three days a week. Uh, and we are performing interventional type of procedures the other two days a week. Oh, okay, that's good to know. Okay. Yep. And um, and we have the two locations, uh, and uh, so we're really uh, pretty readily accessible for most folks in the Greater Richmond metropolitan area, both on both sides of the river. Now, is this <laughs> unique to Richmond? I mean, I, your background certainly I feel is unique. I haven't heard of the two combinations. Mm -hmm. Is that um, something that we would find all over the United States or is this new and innovative? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the field of pain medicine is relatively new compared to many other fields of medicine. Um, and, um, and as a result, um, we, we see physicians who uh, are pain medicine physicians or spine interventionalists like myself uh, coming from uh, coming from a number of different backgrounds. Uh, my background, as I mentioned before, is physical medicine and rehabilitation. There are also pain medicine specialists who come from a background of anesthesiology. Mm -hmm. And there are also pain medicine specialists who come from a background of neurology and of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so <clears throat> in Richmond, uh, there are uh, a number of very talented pain medicine physicians. Uh, and. Um, uh, that that is true in in multiple areas of the country. Uh, we're fortunate in that um, here in Richmond we have a excellent pain medicine fellowship training program, uh, and that is at uh, the Medical College of Virginia here in downtown Richmond. And uh, and I'm very fortunate to be part of that fellowship training program. I'm one of three site directors for the fellowship program, which means that I get to have a student with me pretty much all the time. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, and that student is learning during his or her 12 months uh, with me and the rest of the uh, attending physicians, the teaching physicians in the program, how to become pain medicine specialists. And, and those physicians are of varying backgrounds. Um, uh, this year we are working with uh, several physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians and also a neurology physician, a neurologist. Uh, and in the past, we've had uh, we've worked with a number of anesthesiologists. So <clears throat> there's a number of different ways of getting to the point of being a pain medicine specialist or a spine interventionalist. Uh, and um, 
And here in Richmond, we have um, the benefit of uh, being backed by a excellent academic medical center and have a great training program, which means we do a lot of uh, not only clinical work on the day-to-day -day basis of the clinic, but uh, after hours, we're also doing academic work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Amber? Um, our, I work in the hospital, so it's kind of a 24-hour, you know, it's open 24 hours a day. Everyone's, all the patients stay there. Physical therapy typically takes place between 9 and 4. Um, as far as outpatient, we generally have some earlier morning appointments, like 8.15, um, going until um, about 4, so that if people need to come before or after work at the end of the day, they can, they can do that. And um, some of our other sites you know, may have even more extended schedules than that to accommodate for people's um, individual schedules. Um, so, you know, definitely the website and then co contacting our referral number, um, you could get an appointment with a physical therapist. Usually you're going to need a physician's prescription first. It doesn't have to be a specialist. It can be a primary care physician, um, but you'd want to have um, a referral from, from the physician to say, you know, physical therapy and kind of what the idea, what's uh, the diagnosis that they'd like to be treated. Now you, I'm going to go back to the very beginning when you talked about preventive health because really that's what we want to get back to. And you know, we really want to say, you know, we want to have good health and um, really hardwire lifestyle. So you said something very interesting about smoking, which mm -hmm. um, again, I'm starting to talk about those risk factors and lead a nice segue to next week. Why is smoking something that... Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, um, people generally think of smoking and lung cancer. I think mm -hmm. um, that's what's kind of out in the public. Um, but there are a lot of other uh, damages from smoking. Um, related to the spine, a lot of it is that there is um, a general decrease in some of the smaller blood vessels um, that carry blood and oxygen to our tissues. And um, so say, for instance, those spinal discs. Um, if in a smoker, they might, may not receive as much blood flow mm -hmm. as someone who's a non-smoker. And I think it's, it's still individualized. There's some individual factors that also account for that, but that could lead you more prone to injury. Or if you've had an injury, the healing process could be slower in someone who's um, smoking. And then there are other um, detrimental effects to the body, such as um, artery clogging is uh, you know, more uh, likely to occur when you um, smoke. And um, so we, we could see strokes in people that are smokers because they have um, hardening of their arteries and things from smoking for a long time. So. And any of your interventional techniques can, are there things that patients take home with them or is everything done in the office? Take home, like information um, that they take or home or actual pieces of equipment, actual hardware? Actual equipment or hardware. The, the only thing, um, the only technique that we utilize uh, where uh, a patient would have to take home equipment would be a spinal cord stimulator. Okay. which we were talking about briefly before, which is the electrode that gets placed near the spine mm -hmm. and it creates an electric current in the spine. Uh, for a spinal cord stimulator, we first start with a trial uh, and if the trial is successful, then ultimately the device is surgically implanted under the skin. Okay. And during the trial process, which typically lasts for about seven days, um, the patient will go home with a very small wire actually coming out of their back and that wire is connected to a little handheld box that you would wear on your belt, almost like a little cell phone. And that device allows the patient to be able to control the intensity of the electrical stimulation and change different programs, different patterns of electrical stimulation. Okay. And is that done if they have to have that by a general surgeon, or is it done by you? Is it done by you? In, in my particular clinic, I would do a trial for a patient, and, okay. and if the trial was successful, then a permanent implantation would be done by a surgeon, and it would typically be a spine surgeon, okay. as opposed to a general surgeon. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't want to open Pandora's box, but somebody did send me an email and said, "What are your thoughts on a chiropractor?" And where you know, so where does that fit into, the, does that treatment fit into the treatment spectrum? My, my personal opinion about chiropractic treatment is um, that under certain conditions um, for certain diagnoses, chiropractic treatment can be very helpful. Um, <clears throat> uh, some physicians don't share that particular opinion and they're worried about 
uh, chiropractic treatment, particularly chiropractic adjustment causing injury to the spine. Um, I think that's very rare that that occurs. Uh, and, and, and as I said, for certain conditions, particularly joint arthritis of the spine, those uh, conditions similar to that, uh, chiropractic care has been very helpful for a number of my patients. Uh, and, um, and we will oftentimes employ chiropractic treatment uh, as an adjunct to the other things that we're doing for that patient in clinic. Hmm. Interesting. What about um, Amber? You have anything else that you would like to say in reference to that? No, I think it can be a, definitely a complementary treatment. Um, what the physical therapist can really offer is also the additional specialty that we have in exercise. And mm -hmm. so often um, there needs to be some exercise approach in addition to um, just that kind of adjustment um, of the spine. Um, Again, because people will typically avoid activities, so they might get weak um, or their balance might decrease. So um, I definitely think it can be a complementary approach. Um, and then if the patient has deficits in strength or balance, you know, then that's um, a time where a referral to a physical therapist would be really helpful um, to kind of support the, the treatment that's done by the chiropractor so that the patient over the long term um, is not having to, you know, maybe go back for treatments, um, you know, on a regular basis. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about um, it takes time and, and people have to have patience. So I wanted to just open that up to you all. A lot of people want a quick fix. Indeed. And so if you could both speak to that, because I often say it's a journey, but if you could speak to that. Sure. Sure, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes uh, when I'm uh, seeing a, a new patient for the first time, um, the history is 20 to 30 years of back pain or neck pain. Wow. Uh, and, um, and, and that's a topic that we actually go over in, in quite an amount of detail at the initial evaluation is that um, there, are, there are oftentimes tools uh, that we can utilize that are likely going to be able to move that patient forward as far as decreasing pain and increasing functionality, movement, um, but it's definitely not going to happen overnight. Uh, and uh, it takes time for uh, muscles to be strengthened. Uh, it takes time sometimes to uh, assess the uh, mental status and overall general mental health of, of a particular person who's been dealing with pain for an extended period of time. Uh, and so we, we set expectations um, at the initial evaluation. Uh, and, and once that conversation has is, is, is been held and both sides uh, understand that concept, then that usually allows us to move forward with treatment much more effectively. Mm -hmm. Amber, any closing? Yeah, I would agree. It's really interesting. Um, you know, a lot of people have some impairment for a long time before the pain becomes debilitating enough that they're seeking care. Mm -hmm. And so they really need to pay attention to the fact that this has kind of been a long process in, in reaching that point of, you know, I, I cannot go on any longer. And so it's probably going to take, you know, a, you know, an even longer period of time to get back. Um, to where they want to be after that. And um, I think pain can kind of just start this cycle where you get the initial pain and then you start doing things a little bit differently. And then we either, you know, increase the pain because now you're moving differently. Um, and so it's going to take, take real time to kind of um, move back toward those new normal movements. And even if you have an intervention, you're not going to be able to just go right back to, you know, what you, you know, the goal, the ultimate goal is. It's going to be kind of a stepwise process. And um, that's where the physical therapist is really also helpful in kind of determining, you know, from our expertise and people that we've seen, um, you know, what's the best best next uh, the next best step um, as opposed to you know you you're thinking here's a and here's B and you know mm -hmm. I just want to move along there's definitely a stepwise process that the physical therapist can be really helpful to toward and also to know that with physical therapy there's a lot that you do outside of the clinic so if you're um, an outpatient coming in twice a week we're going to give you exercises, um, you know, between visits to be working on, um, and you're going to have to really commit your time and energy to that if you want to see the result. Um, I'm not going to be able to lay my hands on you and fix you. You're going to have to really kind of um, take responsibility in performing a lot of those things on your own as well. Well, thank you both. See you all next Wednesday. I think our time is almost up. I think what we heard today was great. Please know that it, it takes time. Um, 
pain is something that is real. We've heard that as well. And that we want to make sure that there are various types of treatment to take care of yourself and your spine. So until next week, have a safe and narrow week. And we are happy to see you back next week to talk about uh, our stroke risk factors. Have a good evening.